NoSQL databases and key value store. I am Dr. Rajiv Mishra working as professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Patna. Content of this lecture, we will cover relational versus NoSQL databases, design and insight of NoSQL and key value store for today's edge storage systems, NoSQL storage system that is Apache Cassandra, Cap Theorem and Consistency Solutions. <coughs> Let us review the relational databases to make an understanding of this particular lecture. So in a traditional relational database, data often is stored in the form of a table and this is there which is called a schema and schema is imposed on the data that is called structured data because the data is stored in the form of tables. Now each row in the table has a unique primary key and often the data which is stored in the, in the table is queried using a language called structured query language SQL, SQL. Now this particular language SQL often supports join across the table. So if more than one tables are there then to satisfy a particular query which contains more than one table requirement to satisfy the query it requires the join operations. Relational databases often for transactions, it uses the acid properties, atomicity, consistency, isolation and durability that is abbreviated as acid properties. So the transactions in the relational database management system is providing or is satisfying the acid properties. Now this particular relational database is backed by B tree and B plus tree data structures and which is often optimized for reads. <coughs> this relational database scales well that is vertically scale up. Vertically means that if let us say that you want to scale vertically that means you have to replace the system with a new powerful system and that is called a scale up. So let us see few examples as per the review of relational database. So let us consider the two tables. The first table is called users table. The second is called block table. Now users table, you see user ID becomes the primary key and the block ID or a ID in a block table becomes the primary key of the other table. Now if the users table to join operation it will be having the blog ID as a foreign key and this particular foreign key is used to join blog table. So you can see user table has user ID name, zip code, blog URL, blog ID whereas the blog table contains ID URL, last updated, num post and so on. So let us take this SQL query. Uh, in the relational database example of two tables. For example, if you want to select zip code and zip code is there in users table. So that you can write down that select zip code from users where name is called to John. For John's what is the zip code that you can get through one table query. Similarly, if let us say you want to select URL, URL is found in block table, the other table. So if you want to find out only the URL, so from the block table where ID is equal to 11 for ID is equal to 11, you can get the URL first that is smith.com will be the reply. Third query will involve both the tables, the join operation is to be there. So for example, you want to select users dot zip code. So users table has the zip code 
and also you want the block dot num post. So num number of posts num post is found in block table. So both the tables are required to satisfy this query from the user's joins block table. So the join operation has to be performed across both the tables. On users dot block URL is equal to block URL. So users table has the block URL and that should be equal to the block table URL. So let us see uh, what is the uh, URL which is common in blog URL of users table and also the URLs of blog table. So you can see it is smith.com is coming same. So uh, for that uh, you want to give the users dot zip code smith zip code is 98765 and the blog uh, dot num post is 991. So these will be the out outcome of this particular query. So often in the relational database management system which is also called a structured data because the structure is in the form of the table that means all the data has to be schema driven has to fit into the table and then to perform this particular type of SQL you require the join operation and uh, primary key foreign keys are often their foreign keys is supporting the join operation and uh, this primary key is able to access the data. So that becomes the background of uh, the relational database management system. Now let us see about today's workloads in edge computing system. So what we find is that so in the edge computing workload is not the structured data coming out the workload is in the form of unstructured data and this unstructured data is quite difficult to fit into the schema or put in the form of a table where data can be fit into a table. This is one problem with the, com with the workloads coming out of the edge computing. Now another mismatch is that lots of random reads and writes are there which are coming from the clients distributed over the network. Then there is a foreign keys uh, rarely needed and joins are often infrequent, data caching requirements, low latency, read and write, more write intensive. All these are some of the problems of edge computing workloads. So what is the needs of today's edge computing workloads is that speed that is which contributes toward reducing the latency resources that is compute and storage which is distributed across the nodes. So avoid single point of failure, SPOF, low TCO that is total cost of operation and total cost of ownership, incremental scalability, horizontal scalability are the requirement of uh, the needs of today's edge computing workloads. Now we have to understand one important concept which is called a scale out and not a scale up. So scale up as you know, have known that in relational database management system uses scale up that is vertical scaling to increase the capacity. But this is not a cost effective because old system you have to now replace with a new one and this uh, particular in investment will be quite huge in scaling up the system. Now as far as what is the other side is called scale out that is called horizontal scaling. So you keep on adding more number of nodes may not be very powerful one that also will serve the purpose. So scale out that is called horizontal scaling vis a vis the scale up uh, vertical scaling is cost effective over a long duration phase in a few newer that is faster machines as you phase out a few older machines commonly used in data centers and clouds today and suitable for edge computing scenarios. So NoSQL data model, so NoSQL or it is also called not only SQL is a flexible database management approach. Now this NoSQL data model supports a variety of data models such as key value, document, tabular and column, graph and multi modal. Now NoSQL data model is also often designed for 
large amounts of data, high throughput is required in that, and then it is designed for distributed and in a running in a clustered environment, and it is often designed for scalability support, and then it is also uh, supporting the partition tolerance, high availability that is the replication. So the typical examples of NoSQL databases are the names you must remember with the with the logo. So MongoDB is one of the example of a NoSQL database. The other example of a NoSQL database is Apache Cassandra. This I like symbol uh, logo is there. Then Apache HBase is also an uh, example of a NoSQL database. Amazon DynamoDB is also an example of a NoSQL database. Neo 4J is also an example of a NoSQL database. Then uh, RavenDB is also a NoSQL database. CouchDB uh, is also NoSQL database. Redis is also a NoSQL database, Hypertable and OrientDB. So let us understand about in this concept of NoSQL, what we mean by the key value stores. So a dictionary like data structure create, read, update, delete by key. So it's called a dictionary like data structure and it supports the operation called key value stores. There, each piece of data or the value in the store is associated with a unique identifier which is known as a key. For example, the business, in any business, what is the key and the value? Let us understand. Take the example of a flipkart.com, their item number becomes the key and the information about that item associated with it becomes the value. Similarly, another business called easemytrip.com, their flight number becomes the key and the information about the flight such as availability and so on becomes the value. Twitter.com, so information uh, that is tweet ID becomes the key and the information about the tweet becomes the value. My bank, let us say SBI and all, account number becomes the key and the information about it becomes the value. So a key value store is a type of database where data is stored in the form of the key value store. So let us take more example about the key value data model. So as you know that key value data model supports unstructured data like for edge computing or a cloud computing workloads. So let us consider what you mean by the key value or unstructured data where there is no schema imposed on the data when it is being stored. So take this example of a user's uh, there, the key is a user ID will become the key and all other columns or attributes becomes the value. For example, user ID 110 and the, the information about that user ID that is the name, zip code, block URL and so on becomes the value. Now here when you say that it is unstructured, no schema is imposed. So for example, 331 user ID whose name is Anthony, you don't know the zip code. Similarly, for all the cases, you don't have the information about blog URL at all. So you can see it is all acceptable, that is fine. And uh, uh, blog URL is not needed also, why? Because this is a foreign key and joins may not be supported. So in the other table, that is the blog, their ID is the key and rest are all URL last updated num post becomes the value. So now this blog URL, uh, uh, which is uh, common, which is becomes the foreign key is not needed and some columns may be missing from some rows that is, that is also fine because it is an unstructured data and there is no schema imposed, no foreign key is needed. Some rows, some data in the rows are missing, some columns are not needed, that is all fine and this is called key value data model which we have discussed. Now after having understood key value stores as the data model, let us understand the concept of a column oriented storage. NoSQL system often use the column oriented storage, relational database store an entire row together on disk or, or, or at a server. 
NoSQL systems typically store a column together or a group of columns. Entries within a column are indexed and easy to locate given a key and vice versa. So, why useful? Range searches within a column are fast, no need to fetch the entire row and get me all the blog IDs from the blog table that were updated within the past month. Now, search in the last updated column, fetch corresponding blog ID column and do not need to fetch the other columns. <coughs> Let us understand the design of Apache Cassandra. So, Apache Cassandra is a NoSQL data distributed database that is very, very important to understand. So, Apache Cassandra is a trademark and this particular Apache Cassandra is a NoSQL distributed database. There, the servers are called as a nodes and the servers are there inside the data center. And if you connect logically these nodes, this will be in the form of the ring that is shown over here. There is a circle which connects all the nodes together. Now, these nodes or the servers will have, it is a server uh, which has the capacity of compute plus it has the storage capacity 1 terabyte throughput also is in the form of 3000 transactions per second per core and the communication across these nodes are done with a, with a protocol which is called a gossip protocol. So, this particular ring or Apache Cassandra is intended to run in the data center and also across the data centers. This Apache Cassandra was originally designed at the Facebook and now open source later. Now, today it is uh, one of the most uh, sought after uh, the Apache project <coughs> often used in many e-commerce or many uh, internet based um, uh, sites. So, some of the companies that use Cassandra in their production clusters are IBM, Ad Ad Adobe, HP, eBay, Ericsson, Twitter and Netflix. So, let us see about the features of Cassandra which is uh, used uh, in the cloud as well as in the edge computing system. So, the features are as follows, uh, first feature is distributed and fault tolerant, it can run on multiple machines while appearing to the users as a united whole, allows replication across distributed node and online replacement of the failed nodes, no single point of failures, here the nodes communicate with one another through a protocol called gossip which is a process of computer peer to peer communication masterless architecture it is and any node in the database can provide the exact same functionality as any other node contributing to the robust and resilience. Multiple nodes can be organized logically in a cluster or a ring. Elastic and scalable read and write throughput both increase linearly as the new machines are added with no downtime or interruption to the applications can stream data between the nodes during the scaling operations, can add new nodes during the peak uh, traffic. So, Cassandra data model, Cassandra provides a Cassandra query language, CQL and SQL like language to create, modify, delete database schema as well as access data. CQL allows users to organize data within, within a cluster of Cassandra nodes using key space contains the tables and the tables are composed of rows and columns. So, tables are partitioned based on the column provided in the partition keys. <coughs> partition is defined, defines the mandatory part of the primary key. Uh, all the rows in the Cassandra must have the identify the node in a cluster where the row is stored all performant queries supply the partition key in the query. <coughs> Row contains a collection of the columns identified by a unique primary key made of the partition key and optionally additional clustering keys. Column is the single datum with a type which belong to a row. Column defines the types schema for a single <coughs> datum in a table. 
So, Cassandra data partitioning uh, partitions the data over the storage nodes using a special form of hashing called consistent hashing. Each partition can be replicated to the multiple racks, <coughs> the physical nodes and even the data centers. Now, every replica can accept the changes mutations to each key independently. So, let us take this example of data partitioning. So, you can see that the entire data which is there in the table, which is there in the in the table shown over here, often is stored across the nodes. So, you see that uh, the <coughs> this part of the table is stored in the node this node, let us say node 1, whereas, whereas the FR or this part both of them they together are stored in the second node and JP is stored let us say on the third node and CA both of them they are stored in the uh, this node and then AU and IN together they are stored in this node. And finally, and the uh, AU and uh, IN is there then UK is stored in this node and finally, D E appearing two places, they are together stored in this node. So, node number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So, 7 nodes, <coughs> this table is stored on 7 different nodes. Nodes are also known as servers. So, this particular partitioning of this particular data is done with a partition key. So, you might have seen that USA um, or a country code becomes the partition keys and they are often used to store the data here that is that concept, this concept is called data partitioning. So, data partitioning now when the mutation occurs, the coordinator hashes the partition key to determine the token range the data belong to and then replicates the mutation to the replicas of that data according to the replication policy. So, all replication strategies have the notion of replication factor RF which indicates the number of copies of the partition that should exist. So, meaning to say that here in the data partitioning, not only the partition the data, but also there is a concept of replication factor. So, that means each partition requires to be stored in replicas. So, if the replication factor is 3, that means 3 times that particular data is stored. Take this example 59, data is 59 is stored in 3 places 0, 83 and 67, they are the node IDs. So, this particular data uh, will be stored at three places and that is what is called replication factor. Now, where it will be stored, this will be decided by the, a coordinator that is one of the nodes here in this particular ring is, identi is, is designated as the coordinator. So, this when a mutation occurs, the coordinator hashes the partition keys. So, the partition key is given over here to the coordinator and it applies a hash function with a partition key and this particular partition key in response will give the node or a partition or a node. So, it gives a mapping of the node and so what it does is it gives the hashing of one node and then on the on the left side the leftmost node or, or the left node 
will be the second replica and further the left of that node becomes the third replica. So, because of the replication factor, it will be also stored over here, replication factor it will be stored over here. So, this way it satisfies the replication factor is equal to 3. So, at 3 places every node has to be there and this particular uh, concept is also a part of data partitioning and explained over here. Now, Cassandra uses last write wins model to resolve the conflicting mutations on the replica set. So, in the last write wins model, every mutation is time stamped using deletes and then the latest version of data is the winning uh, value. Self healing, when we have the multiple replicas for the same data and if a node goes down, a hardware drive uh, fails or AWS resets an instance, replica ensures that data is not uh, lost. So, coordinator there stores a hint for that data as well and when the down replica comes up, it will find out what is missed and catch up to speed with the other two replicas this is done completely automatically. So, this is the use of the replica. Now, coming up to refresh the concept of hashing. So, consistent hashing is also to be now understood vis-a-vis -vis a naive hashing. So, naive hashing uses let us say n buckets assign every server to a bucket between 0 to n we name it as the servers. So, example shows n 0, n 1, n 2, n 3. These buckets are nothing but they are the servers. So, here we are using the servers or the nodes. Now, using naive hashing, uh, naive hashing using n buckets, you have to assign every server to the bucket between 0 to n that we have explained. Now, hash of the input key modulo n. So, input key, let us say that it comes out to be 15. Now, 15 mod 4 becomes 3. So, the hash will be stored in n3 here in this particular case. So, so, hashing on a key becomes 15 and that particular object with that particular key 15 will be stored in N3. So, that is how the naive or a consistent hashing will be or, or a naive hashing. Now, there is a problem in the naive hashing is that adding or removing a single node requires shifting almost all the stored keys. So, it is better to use the consistent hashing. So, Cassandra uses the concept like consistent hashing, not the knife caching. So, let us take this example that if you have uh, adding of a node, let us say n4, now you have the total number of servers instead of mutation that is instead of 4, it becomes 5. So, when you do this kind of server is equal to 15 mod 5 becomes 0 here in this case. So, when you hash key with 15, the data object with the key uh, will be there and that means you have to shift all the nodes. Suppose we have 16 objects that is the keys stored on 4 different servers distributed equally with the hash key ranging from 0 to 15, how many objects must be moved if we add one more server that is more than 12 objects. So, all the objects from keys 4 to 15 will have to be moved here in this example. So, uh, in Cassandra uh, about data partitioning, let us understand about the self healing concepts. So, here when we have the multiple replicas for the same data and if the node goes down or a hardware drive fails or AWS resets and advance, then replication ensures that data is in loss. For example, in the figure number 1, if you see the particular node goes down and this particular nose node goes down that means it is it is not working now as far as the replication of this particular data is concerned this node is concerned so it uses the hinted hand of mechanism so when it comes up 
you can understand that this particular node will now be sync with other nodes. For example, this particular node should has uh, has missed this storage of data that is 59. It is stored at this particular location, but not at this location because the node was down in that is shown over here. Now, it uses the hint and the hint is stored here on that particular coordinator that is on the partitioner. So, it is the responsibility of the partitioner that when it comes up for example, here when the node comes up it has the stale value that is previous values, but later on using this hinted handoff hinted handoff mechanism. Now, this particular coordinator will use the hint and it will then update those particular data which is being lost. So, this particular process which is being used by the coordinator that is called hinted handoff mechanism is to do the self healing that is if the node goes down and all the replicas are not consistent then in that case hinted handoff mechanism used by the coordinator is to ensure that consistency across all the replicas is maintained. That is let us understand about hinted handoff mechanism. So, the coordinator stores the hint here for the data as well as when the when the downed replica comes up it will find out what it missed and catch up to the speed with the other two replicas and this is done automatically. So, hinted handoff mechanism we have explained you and this ensures the self healing process in this case. Now, coming to the Cassandra like most important part is the hashing. Now, here the hash objects and the servers use the same hash functions to a common hash space. Now, it is quite similar to the consistent hashing. Take this example in this particular figure that Cassandra maps every node to one or more tokens here in a continuous rings and defines the ownership by hashing. and defines it with a hashing a key onto the ring and then walking around. For example, if this hashing comes over here, so it then walks around the clockwise, it then walks clockwise in one direction that is quite similar to the called algorithm. The main difference of consistent hashing to the naive data hashing is that when the number of nodes that is the buckets into the hash to the hash into the changes. So, consistent hashing only has to move a small fraction of the keys here in this case. So, the objects and the servers are hashed using a common hash space. Now, to locate a server a corresponding to a particular key the move in the clockwise direction that is shown over here for example, for key k 2 now, you have to now hash use the hash function for key k 2 and it will give that particular location over here. Now, then you have to move the clockwise till you find a node till you find a node in a, in a clockwise direction until the first node you find out. So, this key which is giving some value let us say uh, let us say this location and using this uh, uh, location you have to move clockwise to locate the first particular node or the server where this particular key will be stored. So, key to the server mapping key to the server mapping is done with the help of a partitioner that we have already discussed. Now, let us see about more details about that the hashing with the replication. So, for example, if we have a 8 node cluster like here n 1 to n 8, 8 node cluster with evenly spaced tokens. So, for example, the tokens are evenly spaced and replication factor of 3 let us take into an account then to find the owning nodes for a particular key we first hash that hash a key that 
key to generate the token which is just the hash of a key and then we walk the ring in a clockwise fashion until we encounter three distinct nodes at which point we have we found all the replicas of that particular key for example of an eight node cluster with rf factor is equal to 3 can be visualized as shown in this particular figure so here we have to see that uh, that the replication factor of 3 and we have the eight node cluster with evenly spaced tokens which is shown over here now the coordinator here the hashes that key to generate a token for example here the hash of a key that is foo will generate a particular token this way and then it will move to the clockwise direction till it finds three different nodes. This is one such node then it keeps on moving to the clockwise till it gets the second node and then it will move to the clockwise till it gets the third node. So, the hashing of a particular key foo it will get three nodes one is called n 2 the other is called n 3 and finally, it will got n 4. Now, coming up to the next key that is called a bar. So, if you use the hashing technique with the key that is bar. So, this particular bar will be now pointing to this particular location or the place. Now, it will use this location and moving to the clockwise direction till it finds three different nodes n 3, n 4 and n 5 that is what shown over here that we have taken up in this particular example. So, here walk the ring in a clockwise fashion until we encounter three distinct nodes at which point we found all the replicas of a particular key. Now, let us see this in this case when adding new nodes only the fraction of the keys need to be moved to the newly added node. Now, here in case a node on a ring fails it requires to move all the keys to, to the next node that is in the clockwise in the ring and it requires moving a significant fraction of the keys in this case. So, take this particular that if a new uh, so n 4 is added. So, if whenever a new node is added now the key k 2 need to be moved from, from n 2 to n 4 because n 4 is now n 4 is now uh, is, a, is a new node which is being added. So, this particular key so you see that when a new node is added only a fraction of uh, only a fraction of the keys need to be moved here in this case when a new node is added. So, when a new node is added only a fraction of the keys need to be moved to the newly to the new node. Now, consider that when a particular node fails for example, n 2 is a node when it fails. So, all the keys which are mapped to the n 2. Now, it requires to move all the keys to the next node in the in the clockwise next node in the clockwise is n 3 all the keys which is stored in n 2 need to be moved to the next node in the ring it requires moving a significant fraction of the keys here in this particular case. All the keys which are mapped to n 2 need to be moved to n 3 because n 2 is not working it is down. So, when n 2 fails all the keys in n 2 need to be moved to n 3 that is what is explained over here. Now, Cassandra uses a concept which is called a virtual nodes. So, virtual nodes in, in the Cassandra requires a mapping of tokens that is a single position in the ring to the end points that is a single server and a physical IP called the token map. So, the Cassandra keeps track of what ring positions map to which physical endpoints. For example, in the following figure we can represent 8 node cluster using only the 4 physical nodes by assigning 
two tokens to every node. So, here you can see in this particular architecture that you have uh, eight node cluster using only four physical nodes by assigning the two tokens to the every node. So, here you can see that these are the physical nodes eight node cluster and using only the four nodes. So, these are the physical nodes n 1, n 2, n 3 and n 4 these are the physical nodes, but it now collapses and stores like eight node cluster. So, therefore, eight nodes when mapped on four different physical nodes. So, every node will be storing two different token and this is called a token map. So, the Cassandra advocates for the use of virtual nodes to solve this imbalance problem. So, Cassandra introduces some nomenclature to handle the virtual nodes concepts. So, token a single position in on the hash ring then endpoint a single physical IP and port on the network, host ID a unique identifier for a single physical node usually present at one endpoint and containing one or more tokens. Then virtual node a token on the hash ring owned by same physical node one with the same host ID. So, virtual nodes solve the problem by assigning multiple tokens in the token ring to each physical node by allowing a single physical node to take multiple positions in the ring we can make a small cluster look larger and therefore, even with a single physical node addition we can make it look like we have added many more nodes effectively taking a small number of pieces of data from more ring neighbors when we add a even single node. For example, in the figure we can represent eight node cluster using only the four physical nodes by assigning two tokens to every node. Now, trade off is that a greater number of virtual nodes also requires a more storage for metadata. Now, multiple token per physical node provides the following benefits. First, one when a new node is added, it accepts appropriately equal amount of data from other nodes in the ring resulting in an equal distribution of data across the cluster. When a node is decom uh, decommissioned, it loses data roughly equally to other members of the ring again keeping equal distribution of the data across the cluster. Now, if a node becomes unavailable, every or a query load especially the token aware query load is evenly distributed across many nodes. Now, multiple multiple token however, can have disadvantages. So, every token introduces up to two times replication factor minus one additional neighbors on the token ring which means that there are more combination of the node failures where we lose availability of a portion of the token ring. The more tokens you have the higher probability of an outage. So, cluster wide network maintenance operations are often slowed for example, as the number of tokens per node increase the number of discrete repair operation the cluster must do also increases. So, the performance of the operation that is span the token ranges could be affected. Now, uh, every key space in a Cassandra has its own replication strategy. So, for example, there is a strategy called data replication strategy called simple strategy. Simple strategy is used when you have one data center. So, simple strategy places the first replica on the node, it is selected by the partitioner. After that, the remaining replica are placed in a counter in a clockwise direction in an in the node ring. So, all the nodes are treated identically ignoring any configured data center or the racks. So, this is called the simple strategy. 
So, to determine the replicas for a token range, it reads through the tokens in the ring starting with the token range of interest. For each token, it checks whether the owning node has been added to the set of replicas and adds if not present. This process continues until the replication factor number of distinct nodes have been added to the set of replicas. So, it is useful only for testing clusters when the layout of the cluster is unknown. Now, every case space in the Cassandra has its own replication strategy in that way we are going to see in uh, another strategy. In this strategy Cassandra attempts to choose replicas within the data center from the different racks as specified by the snitch which can be configured in the Cassandra.yaml file. So, they are called rack aware, rack awareness. So, it attempts to choose the replica within the data center from different racks as specified by the snitch. So, if the number of racks is, is greater than or equal to the replication factor for the data center, each replica is guaranteed to be chosen from a different rack. Otherwise, each rack will hold at least one replica, but some racks may hold more than one. Now, it is useful for production environment with known layout of the racks within the data center. Now, Cassandra snitches, it maps an IP to the racks and data centers and often it is configured in Cassandra.aml configuration file. What we have seen so far, the simple snitch which is unaware of the topology and is also rack unawareness. Then second type of snitch is called rack inferring snitch assumes the topology of the network by octet of server's IP addresses for example, 101.102.103.104 will have four different octets. So, if you ignore the first octet, the second octet that is 102 is called data center octet. So, it refers to the data center chosen and within the data center the next octet is about the rack. So, 103 is the rack octet and once the rack is chosen then within the rack there comes the node. So, 104 is the node octet and this is called the rack inferring snitch. So, the rack inferring snitch determines the proximity of the nodes by rack and the data center which are assumed to correspond to the third and second octet of the nodes IP address respectively. This snitch is best used as an example for writing a custom snitch class unless this happens to match your deployment convention. The next is called property file snitch. It uses a configuration file. So, this snitch determines proximity as determined by the rack and data center. It uses the network details located in the Cassandra topology dot properties configuration file. Now, when using this snitch, you can define your data center names to be whatever you want. Every node in the data in, in a cluster is described in Cassandra topology properties file and this file should exactly be the same as on every node in the cluster. And the next snitch is called EC2 snitch used for simple cluster deployment on Amazon EC2 where all the nodes in the cluster are within the same region or a single region. So, in EC2 deployments the region name is treated as the data center name and availability zones are treated as the racks within the data center. For example, if a, if a node is in US East one region, then US East is the data center name and one is the rack location. So, racks are important for distributing replicas, but not for data center naming. This snitch does not work across multiple regions because private IPs. Now, if we are using only a single data center, we do not need to specify any properties. Now, if we need multiple data centers, we can set the DC stuff operations in a in the configuration file. 
Now coming to the read and writes. So writes in the Cassandra. So Cassandra need to be log free and the fast. No reads or the disk seek is needed for operation like write. So client sends the write to one of the coordinator node in the Cassandra cluster. Now coordinator may be per key or a per client or a per query basis. Now per key coordinator ensures it writes for the keys, writes for the keys are serialized. Coordinator uses the partitioner to send query to all the replicas for a given key. Now when the replica responds, the coordinator returns an acknowledgement to the client. Now incoming writes on the nodes, on receiving a write logs it in the commit log on the disk, then it makes changes to the appropriate mem table that is writes are bashed in the mem memory using mem table. Mem table is in held in memory. So typically it is an append only data structure which is quite fast and the cache that can be searched by the key it uses write back as opposed to the write through. So in the write through strategy every write operation that occurs in the memory or the cache is immediately mirrored or written through to the main storage. Now in the write back strategy the write operations are first performed in the memory or the cache and the corresponding data in the main storage is updated. Later the actual write to the main storage is deferred un until it becomes necessary to evict the data from the cache or during a flush operation. So write back caching can provide lower latency for write operation compared to the write through operation as the writes are initially performed in a faster cache memory. So uh, on incoming writes on the nodes, so on receiving the write it first logs on the commit log, this is done for the failure uh, recovery and then make changes to the appropriate mem table, here it is. So here it is shown that when a incoming writes are there, so it has to now writes are bashed in the memory using mem table. So, so mem table is ordered by the object key. So this mem table means in memory uh, the table which makes uh, the changes to the appropriate mem table. So mem table if you if you want to see that it is in the memory, uh, it held it is held in the memory. Typically it is an append only data structure that is why it is fast and the cache that can be searched by the key and the write back as opposed to write through is, is the way uh, it becomes faster. So in the write through strategy every write operation that occurs in the memory or in the cache is immediately mirrored or uh, written through the main storage and that is this is called the write back. So in the write back strategy the write operations are first performed in the memory or the cache and then the corresponding data in the main memory is deferred until it becomes necessary to evict the data from the cache or during the flush operation. Write back caching can provide the lower latency for the write operations compared to the write through as the writes are initially performed in a faster cache memory. Now when this mem table reaches a certain size that means when it becomes almost full it is flushed to the disk using an immutable sorted string table ss table sorted string table this stores the key value pairs in a sorted sequence so the flushing operation is sequential and fast so each ss table represents a small chronological set of incoming changes for deleting a key the corresponding ss tables are marked as tombstone so that is shown over here so they are the entries or the keys which are deleted and this is called tombstone 
because they are marked. You just see that they are not removed, but they are only marked as tomb stone. So, for reading a key, the key is first looked in the mem table and then in the access table starting at the most recent flushed access table. So, the coordinator can control x replicas. For example, in the same rack, the coordinator sends the read to the rep sends read to replicas that have responded quickest in the past. When x replicas respond, the coordinator returns the latest time stamp value from among x. So, x can be configured according to the replication factor. So, coordinator also fetches the values from other replicas. So, checks the consistency in the background initiating the read repairs. If any two values are different, this mechanism seeks to eventually bring all the replicas up to date. <coughs> Reads may be slower than writes as the row may be split across multiple replicas. Hence, multiple stables needs to be touched and that is from the read from. Now, Bloom filter is a is a compact way of representing the set of items. Bloom filter is a space efficient probabilistic data structure which is conceived by Burton Howard Bloom in 1970 and that is used to test whether an element is a member of a set or not. Checking for the existence in the set is cheap. Some probability of false positives that is an item not in the set may check true as being in the set. False negative never becomes the false negative here in the Bloom filter. So, false positive matches the possible, but false negatives are not. In other words, a query returns either the possibly in the set or definitely not in the set. So, elements can be added to the set, but not removed. The more items are added, the larger the probability of the false positives becomes. Now, the membership, cluster membership. So, every member in the cluster maintains a list of nodes that need to be updated as the node join or leave the replication protocol and the data set partitioning rely on knowing which nodes are alive and dead in the cluster. So, that the write and the read operation can be optimally routed. In Cassandra, this kind of liveness information is shared in a distributed fashion through the failure detector detection mechanism based on gossip protocols. So, gossip is used to propagate the basic cluster bootstrapping information such as endpoint membership and the internode network protocol versions. In Cassandra gossip system, nodes exchange the state information that is shown over here between 1 and 2. Not only about themselves, but also about the other nodes they know about that. This information is versioned with the vector clock of generation and the version tuples, where the generation is the monotonic time stamp and the version is the logical clock that increments roughly every second. These logical clocks allow the Cassandra gossip to ignore the old versions of, of the cluster state just by inspecting the logical clocks presented with the gossip messages. So, every node in the Cassandra cluster runs the gossip task independently and periodically every second every node in the cluster updates the nodes heartbeat state and construct the nodes local view of the cluster gossip and point state. Now, pick a random other node in the cluster to exchange gossip and points state with probabilistically attempts to gossip with any unreachable nodes if one exists, gossip with the seed node if that did not happen. So, certain nodes are designated as the seed nodes at the time of bootstrapping in the cluster, any node can be seed node and the only difference between the seed and a non seed is that seed nodes are allowed to bootstrap into the ring without seeing any other seed nodes. Furthermore, once a node when a cluster is bootstrapped seed node becomes the hot spot for the cluster. So, these are some of the basics of gossip protocols which is used here for cluster membership. So, in Cassandra cluster membership, so every node in the in the Cassandra cluster runs a gossip task independently and periodically. So, every second every node in the cluster updates the local nodes heartbeat state 
and constructs a node's local view of the cluster uh, gossip and point state, picks a random other node in the cluster to exchange the gossip and point state with, probabilistically attempt to gossip with any unreachable node if one exists, gossip with seed node if that did it happen in the step number 2. Certain nodes are designated as the seed nodes at the time of bootstrapping a cluster. Any node can be a seed node and only the difference between seed and non-seed is that seed nodes are allowed to bootstrap into the ring without seeing the any other seed nodes. Further note, furthermore, once a cluster is bootstrapped, seed nodes become the hot spot for gossip due to the step number 4 above. Cassandra, the failure detection. So, gossip forms the basics basis of ring membership, but failure detector ultimately makes the decision about if the nodes are up or down. Every node in the cluster Cassandra runs a variant of phi accrual failure detector in which every node constantly making an independent decision about if their peer nodes are available or not. This decision is primarily based on the received heartbeat state phi represents the inter-arrival times of the gossip message which decides the threshold time for if a node has failed phi t is equal to minus log p later t, where t indicates the time elapsed since last gossip message received from an endpoint and p later t indicates the probability of receiving the heartbeat from until t units of time which determines the likelihood of endpoint failures. So, latest version of Cassandra implements a modified version of this <coughs> test assuming exponential distribution of gossip messages phi is approximated as phi t is equal to 0.43429645 multiplied by t by m where m is the arithmetic mean the most recent gossip message inter arrival times. For example, if a node does not see an increasing heartbeat from a node for a certain period of time, the failure detector convicts that the node at which the Cassandra will stop routing reads to it and writes will happen to be the return to the hints. Now, when a node starts heartbeats again, the Cassandra will try to reach out and connect and if it can open communication channel, it will mark the node as available. <coughs> Up and down states are local node decisions and not propagated with the gossip. Heartbeat state is propagated with gossip, but nodes will not be considered each other as up until they are they can successfully message each other over an actual network channel. In Cassandra, uh, the concept of a vector search is a new feature added to Cassandra 5.0. It is a powerful technique for finding relevant content within the large document collection and is particularly useful for AI application. So, vector search is for performing similarity comparison into the machine learning model. We need the ability to store embedding vectors. So, embeddings are compact representation of text or the images as high dimensional vectors of a floating point numbers for text processing embeddings are generally by generated by feeding the text to the machine learning model such as large language model. A new vector data type is added to CQL to support vector search. It is designed to save and retrieve embedding vectors. Now, if you summarize the Cassandra versus RDBMS, so my SQL is one of the most popular uh, and on uh, the data which is more than uh, size 50 GB data, my SQL writes. 300 milliseconds on an average, uh, reads takes 350 milliseconds on an average, whereas Cassandra writes takes 0.12 milliseconds on an average, reads take 15 milliseconds on an average, that is order of magnitudes faster. That is the catch, what, what's, what did we lose that we have to now analyze and understand. So, this is the cap theorem. So, CAP theorem is proposed by Eric Brewer by Berkeley, uh, consequently proved by Gilbert and Lynch, NUS and MIT. In a distributed system, you can satisfy at most two out of three guarantees, consistency, availability and partition tolerance. 
consistency that is all the nodes see the same data at any time or the reads return the latest written values by any client. Availability is the system allows operations all the time and operation return quickly. Partition tolerance the system continues to work in spite of network partitions. So, why the availability is important? Availability is that reads and writes complete reliably and quickly. Measurements have shown that 500 millisecond increase in the latency for the operations at Amazon.com or at Google.com can cause a 20 percent drop in the revenue. At Amazon, each added millisecond of latency implies a 6 million dollar yearly loss. The user cognitive drift that if more than a second elapses between clicking and material appearing, the user's mind is already somewhere else. SLA called service level agreement written by the providers predominantly deal with the latencies faced by the clients. Why the consistency is important? Consistency means that all the nodes see the same data at any time or reads return the latest written value by any client. So, when you access your bank account or investment account via multiple clients, laptop, workstation, phone, tablets, you want the updates done from one client to be visible to the other clients. When thousands of customers are looking to, the book, to book a flight, all updates from any client that is the book a flight should be accessible by other clients. Why the partition tolerant is important? Partitions can happen across data centers when internet gets connected. Internet router outages, undersea cable cut, DNS not working. So, partition can also occur with a data center. So, it's still desired system to continue functioning normally under this scenario. So, cap theorem fallout. Since partition tolerance is essential in today's cloud computing system, cap theorem implies that the system has to choose between consistency and availability. So, Cassandra uses uh, eventual or a weak consistency availability partition tolerance uh, over, over the strong consistency or consistency. Traditional RDBMS follows strong consistency over availability under a partition. So, if you see the cap trade off <coughs> consultancy availability and partition tolerance the starting point for uh, no SQL revolution is that distributed storage system can achieve at most two of C, A and P. So, when partition tolerance is important, you can choose between consistency and availability. So, uh, if let us say that uh, availability part, if it is chosen along with partition tolerance, you can find out the, the, the um, products like uh, Cassandra, React, Dynamo and Odermart. Now, if the consistency is preferred along with the fault tolerance, then you will find the HBase, Hypertable, Bigtable, Spanner and so on. Now, let us see about the eventual consistency of Cassandra. So, if all writes stop to a key, then all its values that is replica will converge eventually. Now, if writes continues, then system always tries to keep converging. So, moving wave of updated values lagging behind the latest values sent by the client, but always trying to catch up. So, may still return the stale values to the client if many uh, back to back writes happens, but works well when there are a few few periods of low writes uh, system converges quickly. Now, relational databases versus uh, key value store. So, relational databases uses uh, the acid properties of a transaction atomicity, consistency, isolation and durability whereas, the key value store like Cassandra follows a base property basically available soft state eventual consistency that prefers availability over consistency. Now, Cassandra has consistency levels, Cassandra is allowed to choose the consistency level for each operation like read and write any consistency level is that any server may not be replica. So, there is the faster that is the corner catches the writes and replica quickly to replies quickly to the clients. All means all replicas ensures a strong consistency, but slowest. 
one it means at least one replica faster than all but cannot tolerate a failure quorum says that quorum across all replicas in all data centers so quorums for consistency in a nutshell quorum is equal to majority that is more than 50 percent so any two quorums intersect client one does uh, write in the red quorum then client two does read in the blue quorum at least one server in the blue quorum returns latest write so quorums are faster than all but still ensures strong consistency so quorums in detail several key value and no sql store such as react and cassandra use quorums so there reads clients specify the value of r which is obviously upper bound n that is the total number of replicas of that key so r is the con read consistency level coordinator waits for r replicas to respond before sending the result to the client in the background the coordinator checks for the consistency of the remaining n minus r replicas and initiates read repair if needed so writes comes in two flavors so client specifies w upper bounded by number of keys n so write consistency level w so cassandra or the client writes new values to w replicas and returns two flavors coordinator blocks until the quorum is reached asynchronous just write and returns so quorums in details r replica r read replica count w is write replica count two necessary conditions one is w plus r is greater than number of keys and and w is greater than n by 2 select the values based on the replication w is 1 r is 1 very few writes and reads w is equal to n r is equal to 1 that is great write heavy <coughs> workload and w is equal to n by 2 plus 1 and r is equal to n by 2 plus 1 great write heavy workloads so when w is equal to 1 and r is equal to n the great for write heavy workloads with mostly one client writing per key so cassandra consistency level is allowed to choose a consistency level for each operation read and write any means any server may not be replica this is the fastest coordinator may uh, may cache write and quickly uh, and reply quickly to the client all replicas uh, slowest but ensures strong consistency level one is at least one replica fastest faster than all and ensures durability without failures now coming to the quorum, so quorum across all replicas in all data centers uh, achieves global consistency but still fast. Local quorum, quorum in a coordinator's data center faster only waits for the quorums in the first data center client contacts. Each quorum, quorum in each data center lets each data center do own quorum supports hierarchical replies. Consistency solutions. Cassandra offers eventual consistency. So, if writes to a key stop, all replicas of a key will converge. Originally from Amazon's Dynamo and LinkedIn's Vodal Mart system. So, that is called newer kind of consist uh, consistency models are striving towards a strong consistency while still trying to achieve high availability and partition tolerance. Some of the newer consultancy models are Causal, Red Blue, Blobalistic, Per Key Sequential, CRDTs, and so on. Now, newer consistency Per Key Sequential, Per Key, all the operations have a global order, CRDT, commutative, replicated data types, data structure for, for which commutated writes give the same result is uh, published by in RIA, France, example value is equal to integer and only operation allowed is plus one. Effectively, servers don't need to worry about consistency. Red blue consistency rewrite client transaction to separate operations into red operations versus blue operations. So, blue operations can be executed in any order across data centers. Red operations need to be executed in the same order at each data center. Causal consistency reads must respect the partial order based on information flow that is published by Princeton and CMU. So here you can see that client A, B, C, there are three different clients. The write for a key, uh, the value 33, which is shown here. So K1, uh, 
uh, that means the client A writes K1 key as value 33 and this particular uh, message uh, now is dependent on the client B uh, which reads key K1 and therefore whatever is the recent write K1 by client A will be now available at client B. Now then client B then write key K2 as 55 and send uh, uh, a message to client C. Now client C on doing this read of key K2 it will return 55 which is being written by client B. Now if we read client C if read K1 it must return 33. So you can see that this particular client C when it writes K1 as 22 and read K1 may return 22 or 23. So causality that is not the messages is being followed here in this case. So the causal consistency that is the reads, reads must respect the partial order based on the information flow is therefore um, is, is used in this particular method. Now which consistency model should you use? Use the lowest consistency from left uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the left consistency model that is correct to your applications and get you the faster availability. Now there are strong consistency models. So linearizability uh, is one of the strong consistency model there each operation, uh, each operation by a client is visible instantaneously to all other clients. So instantaneously in a, in a real time. Similarly sequential consistency given by the Lamport, the result of any execution is the same as if the operations of all the processors are executed in some sequential order and the operations of each individual processor in this sequence in the order specified by its program. So after the fact find the reasonable ordering of the operations and can reorder the operation that obeys consistency at all the clients and across all the clients. Now coming to the acid properties of the transactions example is that new or key value or NoSQL store sometimes called new SQL they are following it. So, so the new SQL follows the acid properties of the transaction which you have seen in RDBMS. So the example of those uh, new SQL systems are called Hyperdex by Cornell, Spanner by Google, Transaction Team by Microsoft Research. So conclusion we have discussed NoSQL database management approach and compared it to the traditional databases. We have also discussed the design of the Cassandra and different consistency models. We have also covered the CAP theorem and we have also given uh, the concept which is followed in the NoSQL system that is Cassandra called base properties uh, compared to the asset properties. So basically available soft state eventual consistency. So eventual consistency and a variety of other consistency models are striving towards strong consistency. Thank you.